break 63 thank you for joining me today uh, today I want to talk about some of the myths that surround this rifle right here which is the M1 Garand I've had this one oh coming up on a year I guess and uh, I've always wanted one of these for their historical uh, fascination but also just for the fact that I've always heard they're a fun rifle to shoot and they are the thing about the M1 Garand, though, is it has a lot of misnomers, untruths, and rumors that have been propagated over the course of uh, a number of years. And it's interesting where a lot of these come from. I'll oftentimes hear a guy say, hey, my great-grandpa or my grandpa fought in World War II, and he told my Uncle Joe that blah, 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 blah. And then you find out that grandpa didn't even see action per se and never fired an m1 grand in anger so a lot of these rumors get spread over the years and that's the way rumors tend to work you repeat it often enough and if enough people repeat it then it becomes a truth well i want to talk about some of those today now if you get anything else out of this video today Use this as your takeaway. If you get an opportunity to pick up an M1 Garand, you should, because these are awesome rifles to shoot. Not only are they historical, but for a semi-automatic rifle, they can be fairly accurate, and it's just a joy to have one of these. The felt recoil on something like this compared to, say, a bolt-action 30-odd-6 uh, is a lot less because you've got this big action spring uh, running the running darn near half the length of this rifle in conjunction with uh, the long piston Now the first rumor that's out there is that you can only fire ammo Specifically designed for the M1 Garand through the M1 Garand and that ammo is typically specified as 150 grain weight uh, 30 odd six and it has to be loaded to a certain specification otherwise the rifle could blow up or it's not going to function properly, and things of that nature. Now, I've found that every commercial type ammo I've used has worked just fine with the M1. The bigger issue than the actual load itself is going to be how it's loaded. In other words, if you tend to load something that has dimensions with a bullet and the cartridge that are too far out of the normal military spec, which is what the rifle is designed for, you could find that you have some failure to feed or failure to eject issues, just like any other rifle that's out there. Let's take a look at some of the, the rounds that I've shot real quick. Now on your right is FMJ 30-06 Springfield, and it says it's for the M1 Garand, and that's from PPU. And I've bought that in quantity, and as you can see, it's a full metal jacket, brass case round, nothing special about it. Coming to the left, you see the Hornady Precision Hunter, and uh, this has a nylon tip on it, and uh, this happens to be of a different grain weight. Uh, this is 178, no problems. Next, you have a very common type of ammo, which is Remington Corlocked. This is 180 grain. As you can see, it has what I'll call an exposed tip where uh, it allows for mushrooming when the bullet strikes a deer, for example. And you see the exact same thing over here. Uh, and this is the Federal Premium 30-odd-6 big game in 165 grain. Now, all of these have functioned fine. Where I think you could get into problems is if you do hand loads, which are way out of spec in terms of the amount of powder that you use, which is going to cause problems potentially for any rifle, or in terms of, as I mentioned before, the overall length in terms of the specification. Now, if you take a quick look here, you'll see that as we go from right to left, right being the PPU made for the M1, and then going to the left, that the actual overall length shortens. Could that be an issue? 
Well, again, I think more of an issue for hand loaders who want to choose a longer projectile or maybe load it uh, to a shorter specification. But none of these rounds right here are going to hurt your, your firearm at all. But I'll tell you, in terms of what I use the M1 Garand for, which is shooting at the range, I want to use the stuff that's the cheapest possible, and that's going to be this right here. I can buy this in bulk, and I'm usually somewhere between 55 and 65 cents a round. Not so for these commercial hunting loads. So my advice to anybody who's trying to save a penny or two is, you know, the best thing you can do is number one, hand load. But number two, the other thing you can do, of course, is um, uh, fire the cheapest ammo that you can. If you want to take your M1 Garand hunting and you want to shoot this type of commercial ammo, it's going to be fine. One other point I'd make regarding using commercial ammo or using higher pressure loads in any firearm, while you might not blow it up, and, and certainly in the case of the way the M1 Garand's built, you're not going to, the higher pressure load you use, the quicker you're going to create wear on your parts. And that's just simple physics. Just because it's got a big action spring doesn't mean that it's going to uh, absorb magically much, much more higher pressure rounds than it would lower pressure rounds, okay? So you might find if you do want to shoot a lot of higher pressure rounds that you might want to get an action spring that's uh, uh, a little bit stiffer to compensate for that. But you're not going to blow your gun up. You might just wear your parts a little bit quicker, but that's true for all firearms. So nothing special about the M1 Garand in, in that perspective. The second myth that's very common about the M1 Garand is that enemy soldiers would wait to hear the ping of a spent end block clip. And they'd know that the guy they're fighting against was out of ammo and had to reload. And that would be the time to charge or move positions. I want you to think for a minute just how ridiculous that is. You guys that go to the range, you ever noticed how noisy it is and there's a bunch of guys firing their rifles at the same time? You've got to figure that in World War II, nobody was wearing ear protection. Not only that, but there was typically more than just M1 Garands and Mauser K98s going off. There was machine gun fire, artillery fire, guys yelling at each other, all manner of things. And if you believe that you had a situation where the enemy was like, hey, we're safe because we heard a ping, that's absolutely ridiculous. And that's a myth that uh, is just that, it's a myth. I've not talked to anybody ever who fought in frontline combat, and I had a couple uncles that fired the M1 Garand in Europe. I've never heard anybody say, yeah, that's a thing, because it wasn't a thing, again, it was a myth that somebody said a long time ago. I suppose that when the end block clip is ejected and makes that ping, that would be a real advantage for an enemy soldier. Well, that guy supposing that gets repeated and then it turns into so-called fact over time. It's just not how it works though. I guarantee you there's been no reports of that anecdotally that I've ever heard. It's just one of those rumors that's out there. This was an innovative design for its time. They had the ability to, to reload eight rounds a lot quicker than a stripper clip, and they certainly had the ability to shoot them a lot quicker than a, a, a stripper clip. But nobody fought warfare where it was one guy against one guy, each with rifles, and the one guy on the other side was waiting to hear the ping. So that's a rumor. I don't care if you heard it from your grandpa or your uncle. Doesn't matter. It's actually not true. I also saw recently uh, in, in a M1 Garand group on Facebook, several guys saying, whatever you do, don't use grease on your M1. Well, that might be case true for a lot of the modern firearms you're using, like an AR uh, or a lot of pistols and things like that. But in the case of the M1 Garand, you absolutely want to grease parts such as this channel where you pull back your action, uh, things of that nature, because these are very large metallic parts working against each other. Now, is grease the best lubricant for all weather conditions? No, 
it's viscosity breaks down, things like that. And we have modern stuff like, oh, CLP you see me talk a lot about. But here's the thing. You got to have more than just viscosity. You've got to have something that provides a very good lubricating surface. And that's where grease really comes into play. If you look on the interweb, or better yet, on YouTube, you'll see, even in some of my earlier videos, there's places where you want to use grease, maybe places that you don't need to. So oil and grease in combination are how you want to keep this rifle lubricated after a cleaning. The last rumor I want to dispel today is that in 2020, the M1 Grand is still the best battle implement ever in, uh, devised. Back in the early to mid 40s, when General George S. Patton made that statement, it was probably true. Although some could argue that things like the proximity fuse or radar or modern battlefield tanks at that time were more effective battle implements. But the case in point is, is for your average troop on either side, this was the way to go for the majority of the war. And we can argue once the STG-44 came into limited use, that might have been a better firearm to have on you. But uh, it's important to remember that this fits a genesis between the 1903, 1917 style of bolt action rifle designs or the K98 Mauser or even the Mosin Nagant. This represents a big step forward from the standpoint of the speed at which you could shoot it and the ease at which you could reload it. So I don't have any problem agreeing that. But to say that this is still the best rifle you could put in the hands of a, a U.S. soldier in 2020, I consider that a preposterous statement for a number of reasons. Back in World War II, guys weren't carrying radios. They weren't wearing body armor. They were involved in a lot of longer distance type of scenarios. In 2020, the amount of gear, food, water, equipment, body armor, and ammo that a troop needs to carry to be effective in combat is a significantly different story. So you need something that got a shorter barrel, you need something that's lighter weight, and you need something that you can carry two to three times as much ammo for. Here I am shooting 20 quick rounds out of a 7.62 Galil. There's just absolutely no way on my best day that I'm going to be able to do that with an M1 Garand at this speed. There's a lot of rumors out there about firearms that I could get into. I could talk about how the 1911 and the 45 caliber miraculously made people roll backwards when they were hitting the shoulder with a slug versus the 38 that didn't do any damage to those big bad Samoan guys. There's a lot of stuff we could get into, but firearms need to be about science and truth. Not what you heard from your uncle. Do your own research, look up ballistics, look at gel tests, learn this stuff. If you want to make comments, make a comment that's based off your education, not based off hearsay or rumors that have been spread forever, which are patently false. Anyway, again, my advice to anybody, if you get an opportunity to pick up an M1 Garand, you should do it. It's an awesome rifle. I love it. I won't pretend that this is the answer for modern warfare, but does it have to be to be a great rifle? Does it have to be relevant in today's battlefield in order to be recognized as a really great gun? No, it was the best in its time. And for those of you, and I fall into this category that romanticize walnut and steel as the way to go with firearms, that's great guys. But don't let that get in the way of facts and what firearms are designed to do. This is DR Drake 63. I really appreciate you watching today. Stay safe, stay healthy. We'll see you next time.